Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. In this video we will be discussing a very important topic that is unfortunately often neglected and that is the importance of biologic width and its relationship with crown margins. This is one of the most critical factors to consider when preparing a tooth for a crown and it is very important in clinical practice because violating the biologic width will have direct consequences on the periodontal health. So you can have a beautiful tooth preparation followed by an excellent crown. But what is the use when the periodontal health around the crown is deteriorating? So let's get started. First, we shall discuss what is biologic width. Now, this is defined as the dimension of the soft tissue which is attached to the portion of the tooth above the crest of the alveolar bone. Now this soft tissue comprises of the connective tissue and the junctional epithelium. For better understanding, let us take a look at this picture. So this is the crown. This is the sulcus. Just below the sulcus, we have the junctional epithelium and the connective tissue and then the bone. So this part is your biologic width. On an average, the connective tissue attachment height is one millimeter and the junctional epithelium is another one millimeter which adds up to 2 mm and this is your biologic width. Now remember this is just an average and it varies from patient to patient. Okay, so now that is clear, let us move on to the importance of biologic width. So in simple terms, biologic width acts as a natural barrier or a shield which prevents the entry of microorganisms in the periodontium. Therefore, it protects the two most vulnerable structures of the tooth that is the periodontal ligament and the alveolar bone. And as this article rightly suggests, biologic width invasion will harm the periodontal health. Now let us see how and when does it come into picture clinically. It is mainly related to the position of your restorative margin. So if you have a crown impinging on this zone, you are invading the biologic width and you end up damaging the periodontal tissues. So whenever you're giving a crown, you have to first decide whether you want your margins to be placed supragingivally, equigingivally or subgingivally. Safest is supragingival or equigingival. In such cases, biologic width does not come into picture at all. These days you have amazing options for lifelike crowns. So if your tooth is not discolored or is not majorly damaged, you can always give a lithium disilicate crown with supragingival margin or equigingival margins. With these material, your crown can completely blend with the tooth and nobody can even make out the difference. So from a periodontal viewpoint, both supragingival and equigingival margins are very well tolerated and the concerns over biologic width do not exist with these. The greatest risk occurs when you're placing subgingival margins. There are times when subgingival margins are necessary, especially if you have minimal tooth structures in cases of damaged or mutilated teeth. Also when the tooth is extremely discolored and to avoid having that striking difference between your discolored tooth and your crown, you have to sometimes go subgingivally. So in such cases, a subgingival margin is preferred and the concern of going too far below the tissues and violating the attachment exists. What happens if you violate the biologic width? Basically, when the crown margin goes beyond the sulcus, it irritates this area and you have two possible consequences. One is bone loss, which may result in pocket formation or gingival recession. One important point that I would like to stress on here is that it is usually seen when you have a thin facial bone and thin soft tissues. So the gingival biotype and the kind of bone also matters. The second and the most common clinical appearance of biologic width invasion is gingival inflammation and bleeding on probing. Basically, the crown impinging in this area acts as a permanent irritant to the junctional epithelium, causing persistent chronic inflammation. So these are some of the clinical pictures that you may relate to and you may not even have realized that it could be because of biologic width violation. So moving on, how will you diagnose that this inflammation around your restoration is because the margins have been placed too deep violating the attachment? The first thought that comes to our mind is excess plaque and calculus or lack of oral hygiene, right? But there is a way that you can rule this out. All you have to do is check if there is inflammation on the adjacent teeth as well. And if not, this is probably not the cause for the inflammation. Other reasons for this kind of inflammation include defective restorative margins, 
wounds or over contoured crowns clinical and radiographic examination will help you eliminate these causes but honestly not much can be done in these cases also you cannot just adjust something and get rid of the inflammation you will eventually have to replace the crowns so circling back to the same question how can we be sure that the margin location is the main problem the answer is bone sounding so what is bone sounding it is a way to measure the biologic width for this you have to first anesthetize the area insert your periodontal probe in the sulcus note the sulcus depth then pierce that periodontal probe through the sulcus till you reach the bone now note this depth also now all you have to do is subtract the sulcus depth from the depth you got by reaching the bone that is your biologic width if it is less than 2 mm then you probably have violated the biologic width Bone sounding not only helps you reach a conclusive diagnosis about the invasion of biologic width but also in the pre-treatment or planning stage. If you have a case where you want to give subgingival margins, it is always better to measure the biologic width as a preventive strategy and you can plan your restorations taking that into consideration. All right? Now coming to a very important part. So consider you have done the bone sounding, you've got the measurements of your sulcus and also the biologic width, right? Now based on these you can categorize them into 3 that is the normal crest high crest and the low crest this crest category allows us to determine the optimal position of the margin placement especially in the anterior teeth remember this is applicable only to subgingival margins the measurements are taken from the mid facial and the interproximal regions and it is measured from the gingival crest to the alveolar bone So the first category is the normal crest in which the mid facial measurement is 3 mm and the proximal measurement is in the range of 3 to 4 mm. So in this case the margin of the crown should be placed no closer than 2.5 mm from the alveolar bone. So a crown margin which is placed 0.5 mm subgingivally into the sulcus tends to be well tolerated. The next category is the high crest patient. So high crest is not something that you find very commonly. It is mostly seen in the proximal surface adjacent to the edentulous site. Usually it is not possible to place a subgingival margin in such cases because the margin will be very close to the alveolar bone resulting in breach of biologic width and that will eventually lead to chronic inflammation. And the third category that we have is the low crest. In the low crest patient group, the mid facial measurement is greater than 3 mm and the proximal measurement is greater than 4.5 mm. So if you have a patient with low crest, they are considered to be more susceptible to recession secondary to the placement of a subgingival crown margin. And now coming to the most important part. So low crest can be stable or unstable. Some low crest patients are susceptible to gingival recession while others have quite a stable attachment apparatus. Now how do you know the difference? So we've already discussed at the beginning the crest position is measured from the gingival crest to the alveolar bone, right? To know the difference between stable and unstable, your sulcus depth and the biologic width comes into picture, okay? Let's take an example. The total distance that you measure from the gingival crest to the alveolar crest is 5 mm, right? This falls into the category of low crest. So in one situation, you may have a sulcus depth of 3 mm, which is considerably deep, and the biologic width of 2 mm. In this situation, you have 3 mm of unsupported tissue from the gingival crest to the base of the sulcus. This unsupported gingival tissue is not stable. and such cases tend to be susceptible to gingival recession so this is classified as unstable low crest okay i hope this is clear now take another situation where again the distance from your gingival crest to the alveolar crest is 5 mm falls into low crest category correct now in this situation if you have only 1 mm sulcus and a 4 mm of attachment or the biologic width that falls into the stable low crest category why because there is enough of attachment apparatus or the biologic width and there is significantly shallower sulcus so a patient with this kind of situation will be much less susceptible to gingival recession so this is your stable low crest and it can be treated more or less like the normal crest i really hope that you all have understood everything that we have discussed because based on all that we have learned so far some rules are given for margin placement 
follow these rules for your clinical practice and hopefully you'll never have to worry about invading the biologic width. Rule number one, if the sulcus probes 1.5 millimeter or less, place the restoration margin 0.5 mm below the gingival tissue crest. So here you are on the safe side. Keep in mind that you may have your restoration in the sulcus, but that doesn't mean that you're invading the biologic width. The problem starts when you approximate the most coronal cells of the junctional epithelium. Now, second rule, if the sulcus probes more than 1.5 mm, place the margin one half the depth of the sulcus below the tissue crest. This places the margin far enough below the tissue so that it is still covered if the patient is at a higher risk of recession. Now, the third rule is, if a sulcus greater than 2 mm is found, then evaluate to see whether gingivectomy could be performed and create a 1.5 mm sulcus. The next thing that I would like to discuss with you guys is the easiest and the most predictable technique of margin placement without traumatizing the gingiva. So first, you have to evaluate the sulcus depth, whether we have a shallow sulcus or a deep sulcus. Then, the first step would be to prepare the tooth completely with the margin placed at the level of your gingival crest. Next, take a thin retraction cord probably a triple zero or a double zero and pack the sulcus with this cord. Then you start preparing subgingivally but make sure that you are right on top of the cord that you have already packed. The advantage of this technique is that the retraction cord will act as a buffer and will keep the tissues away from the bone. Before you proceed with the impression, you can place another larger diameter cord just above the first one. Make sure that you remove this larger retraction cord just before the impression. In cases with deep sulcus depth, you can follow the same procedure but you may need to pack the sulcus with two retraction cord followed by the final subgingival preparation and a third retraction cord just before the impression. And finally we come to the last part of this presentation and that is what if the violation has occurred and how would you go about correcting a biologic with violation? First step would be to diagnose the problem. You need to make sure that the inflammation or the gingival recession that has happened is because of biologic with violation. We've already discussed it in the previous slides. So your clinical and radiographic examination will help, but the most predictable method would be bone sounding. And, and now that you're sure that this is biologic with violation, you can proceed with the treatment. For managing such a complication, you essentially have two options. So when a restorative margin is placed too close to the bone resulting in gingival inflammation the only solution to eliminate the inflammation is to move the margin away from the bone or move the bone away from the margin in most cases the classic measurements can be used for the correction in other words create a 2.5 to 3 millimeter of space between the margin and the bone so there are two ways that you can achieve this one is crown lengthening procedure and the other is orthodontic extrusion crown lengthening is a faster approach as compared to orthodontics the only thing that you have to be careful about is the gingival asymmetry that can happen especially if you're involving only one crown you also have to take care of the crown root ratio while performing clp here the goal of crown lengthening procedure is to move the bone away from the margin so to do this a full thickness flap is reflected and using rotary instruments alveolar bone is trimmed and moved two millimeter apical to the cemento enamel junction the flap is then repositioned and sutured so that the gingival crest is 3 mm from the alveolar crest. This way the tissue heals and remains stable for a long term in the new position. So consult a periodontist and discuss the case with them. The other option that you have to correct the biologic width violation is orthodontic extrusion or post eruption of the tooth. Using this technique, you can avoid having the gingival asymmetry. Orthodontic extrusion will not hamper your crown root ratio because you're pulling the attachments that is a soft tissue and the bone along with the tooth. So this is a better alternative when you want to correct biologic with violation, but it is definitely going to take a longer time. And with this, we come to an end. I really hope that this video has helped you understand the concept of biologic width and how to prevent or correct biologic width violation. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. I promise you I will make dentistry a lot easier and fun for you.